Welcome, folks, to a special edition of the No Conference for Old Med podcast today, where three old guys have a special guest in the University of Houston, Vice President of Athletics, Chris Pesman, joining us for a bit of Q&A. We've got some questions gathered up from fans that hopefully we'll have a bit of fun getting into. And actually, for fans that may not know, Chris is a Houston Cougar through and through former student athlete on the Houston Cougars football team during the great run and shoot era in the early 90s, when both Andre Ware and David Klingler were in school. He was a two-time Southwest Conference Commissioner's Academic Honor Roll member, receiving both his bachelor's and master's degrees from U of H, and has had an impressive run in sports administration at places like Energy Park, Cal Berkeley in the PAC, and now back at Houston for his second stint in the athletics department now heading things up as the VP of Athletics. Welcome to the podcast, Chris, and thanks so much for taking the time out from your busy schedule. I know you and Bill actually have a connection, and that's how we were fortunate enough to get you on. Anything you want to cover off or, or say to kick things off before I turn it over to Bill to start the interview? Sure. Uh, first, thank you for having me. Um, I appreciate being with uh, three old dudes talking about athletics and basketball and all the things in between. Um, this is a really, um, it's, it's a special time at the University of Houston. I mean, we, we say that quite a bit. And, you know, I, I just finished my sixth year starting my seventh and the rate of change um, in, locally at the university and in the city but also in our landscape and intercollegiate athletics has been incredibly volatile over the last, you know, going into seven years. And, uh, it, but at that same moment, you know, we're, we're doing some really remarkable things through all the volatility and it's, it's really, it's really special and, and, and an enjoyable moment. And especially as an alum in this role, it's, it's incredibly gratifying to have the opportunity and privilege to be in this in this position during all these things that are happening and um, just let's get to it. I'm ready for uh, questions from our, from our man, Bill Walker. I'll, I'll give you guys a funny story. So Bill and I are fraternity brothers. And so uh, I interned at Lehman back when that used to be a brokerage firm in uh, my junior and senior year. And Bill doesn't know this. I think I maybe have told them this before, but you, I used to cold call people and qualify leads and you kind of use like a pseudonym when you do that. And I use Bill Walker because I could be Bill Walker, <laughs> William Walker, we Willie Walker, all those things when I was nice. trying to get to anybody to qualify leads. So there's there's probably people out there that have been uh, um, called by Bill and they didn't even realize it. And uh, I, I, I like to use that a lot. That's my go to name when I need to come up with something else. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I didn't know that. But what immediately pops to mind is that is there a statute of limitations on commissions? You know, that's a good uh, question. Like, I, I intern for Howie Lorch, so you know he's holding on to that, Bill. I'm sure. <laughs> okay, Bill, you want to kick things off? Okay, yeah. Virtually all these questions came from Go Cougs, from the, the message boards. And uh, so these are coming from probably the U of H alumni and people following the program. So, yeah, we'll just kick it off. First one, we're in our greatest stretch of basketball uh, with Coach Sampson since the early 80s by Slamma Jamma. The renovations to the Guy V. Lewis Center are now, it appears, completed. What else do we need to focus on in basketball that will allow us to stay at our current elite level from your and, and maybe the coaches' perspectives? with probably an emphasis on NIL money and has anyone figured out a way to structure NIL giving as tax deductible? Yeah. Um, well, it, it, let me, I guess there's a couple of questions in there first. Yeah. Um, yeah we, um, we spent um, close to a little over $5 million uh, renovating uh, the Guy V. Lewis um, facility oh, um, this last summer. Um, you know, that building was, getting close to, I think about seven years old, um, because we opened it yeah. before the Fertitta center, that project was done before I got here. And I'm um, very grateful for the work that was done to provide that for our basketball programs that started, that was the catalyst, you know, I mean, when Kelvin got here, we all know the state of the facilities and what we had not done for a long time. And I I'll reference old Hoffines. I mean, you think about Hoffines and 
how little we did to it. I mean, yeah, we added that center hung scoreboard and the uh, the infamous <laughs> upper level suites. Sweet. So we, yeah. re- but we really didn't do much to invest in our cap in our capital around, frankly, all of our programs. And so the mindset that we have now is to do incremental projects frequently, rather than big, massive projects. Um, try to keep the, the facilities up to speed and current with what we're competing with, um, frankly, in college, but also in the NBA, because a lot of these kids, you know, their aspirations are to go on and compete at the highest level. And there's moments like now with the stature of the team where they have choices, you know, guys get to, after their first year, you know, they start entertaining, particularly with the caliber of players we have, whether they want to return to the university or, or try and, and get into the pros. So, the ability for us to be able to give them first class facilities is paramount, but we have to do that in incremental steps. So that way we don't get hit with, you know, $80 million bills to come in and renovate huge facilities yeah. and try and keep them fresh and updated. Um, really to answer your question, everything focuses for us around resources and principally money. Um, we have to continue to grow our operation budget, um, our operating budgets, and that's just not with basketball, but across the spectrum. At the same time, as we're growing into a new league with institutions that have greater resources for decades, um, we've done a pretty good job, particularly in basketball and football, in closing that gap. But we're still in each of those probably, you know, uh, 15 to 20 percent behind everybody else with their spending in the same sport. But we've been pretty creative with ways to solve that. The next iteration of that, obviously, is NIL. Um, that is, you know, frankly, right now, that's probably about half my job is raising money for uh, name, image, and likeness. We've been very fortunate to be in a major market like Houston, where we have the ability to have businesses that have been very uh, aggressive with supporting us, particularly in basketball where we have to continue to grow and close the gap is on persons that donate to basketball, which leads us to your next point is it tax deductible. You know, there was, um, there was a pathway there this last fall where we thought donors would be able to donate to the university to provide to NIL and then have that be tax deductible and still receive the benefits of it. We were literally in the meeting with our compliance staff, my business staff, and with the, the collective with Austin and those guys and Landon over at Lincoln Cougs. And right when we're in the meeting and we're getting ready to say, okay, here's the plan. Here's, here we go forward. The NCAA during that meeting sent out um, a notice with the IRS that said those things are not tax deductible. So wow. um, we've been trying to be creative with the way that we attack it. So we've kind of got two primary opportunities for people to give. Um, the business solutions tend to be through Lincoln Cougs and the 501c3 solution is through be a champion. There's challenges with that though, because Mm -hmm. with be a champion, you know, that's, that's a nonprofit and there's limitations on higher earning athletes. You know, you get to a point where right around the $50,000 range where be a champion, that vehicle, uh, doesn't work for athletes that earn six figures. So that's why our our solution with uh, the collective with linking Cougs is so important to us. Um, you'll see a very very overt push over the next month um, with NIL specific to basketball and football because we're coming up on the next transfer portal window um, after the basketball season and frankly after our spring football season where we have to have a nest egg that gives our coaches the ability to go out and retain our players or recruit new players in. Um, You know, one thing I want to mention, you know, and I think most people have heard this, our entire basketball team can come back. Uh, Malik Wilson's the only one that will graduate. So you think about guys like Jamal or Jawan Roberts. Um, We have to find new money to increase um, the – you know, the compensation that can come back to them from the market for doing name image likeness opportunities. Um, and, you know, as a, as a round number, we have to find probably about a million dollars of new money for this basketball program uh, to give us the opportunity to bring everybody back. Um, but I mean, think about what we're talking about. We've got the number one team in the country right now. It's everything everybody's always wanted. And we have a chance to get the vast majority of that team back. 
And, um, you know, we, you'll see some real, um, efforts here over the next couple of weeks of us attacking that. And, um, I'm pretty sure that we'll be able to solve that in, in a real way and give our coaches what they need to get these kids back. Nice. Perfect. Okay. Next, the three of us here at no conference for old men, we certainly believe that the Fertitta center is perfect for us, both from a size and configuration perspective. Anyone that's listened to the podcast hears me constantly talk about how we're going to be blowing out everyone that we play at home because the Fertitta Center is the best home court advantage, I think, in the country. But there have been questions that have been asked about adding seats. Some of us have also heard of potentially building out some sealed-off club seating uh, on the concourse around the corners with maybe exclusive bar areas. What's your perspective on the size and configuration of the Fertitta Center since we're at basically at the five year anniversary? Sure. Yeah. I've, I've said um, a lot of people have asked that question. Oh, we need to add seats, all that. The Fertitta Center is perfect. Absolutely yeah. not. Agreed. You know, yeah. Agreed. The, uh, the reality is it, in today's, sports world um premium seating let me let me restart over less is more the ability to have a tighter more intimate environment where you can bring people closer to the court and experience something that they can't experience on tv which we know we fight in this market is getting people in the venue and feeling that energy so you know adding seats you know same thing that comes up with tdcu oh we got to add an upper deck that's not happening anytime in the near future, especially in football, until we know we're sold out and there's a wait list, frankly, like we have in the Petita Center. Yep. What we are exploring is ways to increase our revenue out of the Petita Center. Um, one thing you got to kind of keep in mind, and I'm, it, it's, it's not a criticism and I'm not crying poor, but you know, you think about the tech game last night where they're playing Texas. That's a, uh, what, 15,000 seat building. And so the scale of their revenue, because of the, the number of seats that they have, they have the opportunity to earn more. What we will continue to do is explore new premium opportunities. Like you mentioned, Bill, we're looking at some areas along the concourse where we can add seats or create new premium offerings. Um, there's still some dead space that's down under in the, if anybody remembers the old, uh, you know, dead area, the old service level of uh, Hoffines. I mean, there used to be, Gun ranges in there, racquetball mm. courts, yep. uh, badminton or uh, bow and arrow. There's old trophy storage rooms. So there's two or three of those spaces left. You know, we're exploring whether we can convert those either into another kitchen to help provide additional, mm. um, uh, better service for our guests or another premium offering. We added uh, 40 new clubs, or pardon me, we added 40 new floor seats this last year. Those were gone in a day and a half. That generated eight hundred million, or pardon me, eight hundred thousand dollars of new annual revenue to us, plus the capex investment for those seats. So, the best part is, is we've got a captive audience with the best product in town and in the country. Um, so we're looking at ways to enhance that. Uh, you know, the other thing I'll mention, you know, when we came into the league, we were mindful of our pricing. Uh, we did not want to gouge our fr- our fans in football and or basketball. But with the elevation, with the quality of the product we have, we went up 50% across the board in the Fertitta Center on average. If you if you took the building and blended all the seat prices, we went up about 50%. We're going to need to go up again this next year. We're working through what that is. It won't be 50%. It'll be certainly less than that. But we have to continue to monetize that facility so that we can help support our basketball team. I mean, yeah, it, it, if you guys like winning, you know, it's yep. we got to have some more money. We made a real investment in 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 the staff again this last year with um, redoing coach's contract as it needed to be done to reflect what he's done at a national level and for us here at the University of Houston. But we still have to continue to ways to keep his his staff and those guys are going to be in demand. So it's important for us to go out and find ways to drive new revenue so we can help support the growth that we're experiencing. Perfect. And I'll vouch for the atmosphere for Tita. I actually went to the uh, Iowa State game in Ames, and granted, the students weren't back from break, but I thought the uh, Fertitta Center crowd, it's, it's just more a little bit electric. You know, I think uh, Hilton seats like 14,000. Yeah. 
And uh, I've always heard how loud it gets in all this, but I'd say Fertitta has it beat. Think about the last couple of games. Our students have been lined up for hours in advance yeah. to get in. I mean, everybody wants to think about Coach Kayville. Uh, they do a do- Duke where they camp out. I mean, yeah. we're not far away from that, guys, and that's what's really cool. And we're at a yeah. and we're at a school that is a lot more diverse than those institutions. And a lot of these kids are experiencing yeah. our collegiate athletics at this level for the first time, and it's it's so rewarding. But you know, all the credit goes to you know Coach Sampson and his staff and those kids, and also Tillman and Renew for giving us the support and uh, for the vision and allowing us to get to this point. But that we're, you know, to your point that we started this with, you know, this is um, where we are is, is just, it's an incredible run. And I just want people to remember that this doesn't happen all the time. And so (laughs) make sure you enjoy these moments. It's really special. Hey, Chris, just a follow up question related to configuration. Uh, There's been some questions too around, you know, as we've noticed the great student involvement in that that whole fan area, any talk of reorienting the cameras so that it's actually pointed in that direction to really add to the feel on TV? Yeah, it, that's a great question. You know, it, it's something that, it, you know, you didn't realize it until we got that building open yep. and operating. It's about a million dollars for us to run the cable feeds and to flip it. It's it's on our list. It's something that we want to do. It's just, you know, wants versus needs. Right now we yep. have greater needs and that's more of a want. It works. Yeah. It looks good. Understood. The other part that, I mean, that's kind of fun is, you know, like the last couple of games, those seats are filled. And, you know, particularly early in the season when it's non-conference season, a lot of people have conflicts. You know, it, it's in the other part is a lot of people stand back in that bar area. And that's one of the things that, you struggle with, with club seating like that with bar areas behind it, because you get about half and half, half like to go up and social and drink beers. You know, we've had people say we should have seat fillers. Problem with that is you got to get people in and out of their seats and and inconvenience those that are in their seats. So um, we're exploring all options. I mean, I, you know, we going back to the COVID cardboard cutouts that we used to do in the stands. I mean, there's a lot of things that we've talked about. But right now, um, it is on our list. It's just kind of further down. Bill, you fall asleep there or what, man? No, no, I didn't. I wanted to. I wasn't sure if if Steve might have a a follow up. I just wanted to give him a uh, a second. But uh, no, we're good. Okay, Chris, this is uh, obviously the first year in the Big Twelve. The athletic department, I'm, I'm sure, clearly had to step up its game uh, to match our peers, not only in terms of performance, but in terms of game day experience. What are your thoughts on the athletic department, what it's doing since the transition? Uh, are there any maybe key points, key strategies that you picked up from from any of your peers that you tend to implement as we progress throughout the Big 12? Sure. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, I'll be going to Oklahoma this weekend, and I'm, you know, Baylor at last weekend, and obviously, you know, the the road games with football. Our game day experience is, I mean, well, let me ask you this: you go to Fertitta Center at Rocks, right? And yep. that's yep. driven by butts and seats and the energy that's created from the fans that are in the venue. We have to do a better job, particularly with football, of filling the stadium. Um, we hired Garrett Classy this last. Um, Geez, I guess it was this last spring. It, it's closing in on a year now. Uh, Garrett came to us from Nebraska and has a vast – he'd been everywhere from Alabama to Nebraska and, and all points in between. Um, he's – we've charged him with, as well as myself and everybody else, of making sure that we do everything we can to fill TDECU. We don't have an issue with that, obviously, with, with the Fertitta Center. But TDCU for us, game day football has to get better. Um, For those that came to home games this last year in football, we we made an overt push to improve the tailgating section that's out on Cullen. I think that was a real hit. We saw really active student engagement as well as others. Um, We focused a lot on points of entry, on getting into the stadium. If you noticed at TDCU and now at Fertitta Center, we've pushed the entry process out 
We went and bought new uh, scanners, uh, metal detectors that allow you to pass through. That it's more of a rapid yeah, system. Yeah. Um, we can get a, the throughput of that is about, um, gosh, it's about 10x of what the old style system used to be. So getting people in is not the issue. Where we continue to need to improve um, is butts and seats, but also food service. Um, concessions in particular. Um, that's a real lost revenue opportunity for us, but it's also an amenity that we have to continue to prove for our fans. Um, we started adding a lot more of the pass-through markets where you can go up grab and goes, as we call them. You'll see a lot more of those in football stadium as well as for Tita Center uh, for next season. Um, but to invest in those, I need money and capital to continue to grow. And we've been pushing hard on our partners as well as our donors to help us find creative ways to fund those things. Campus helps us at times where we know there's a definite payback period where we could take short-term bridge loans to get those projects done and then pay it back. But, you know, for us, it's really focusing on getting fans in the stands. And I, I'm really excited, frankly, with coach Fritz. I, you know, it's absolutely, it's been interesting with, with him coming on board and just his personality and the way he reacts with fans. I think that we're going to see a real uptick, particularly around football. Um, and that my whole goal is to take what we do in Fertitta center, bottle it, do it in TDCU, do it out of Trader park, do it out of softball because those are the, those are the, I mean, when you're in Fertitta center on game day, it rocks. I mean, it, 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 it feels right. And that's what we have to continue to replicate. But at the same time, we can't just rest on our laurels. We have to find new ways to improve our game day experience. Lauren Sampson does a great job of uh, helping us orchestrate in-game experience from things that she picks up at other places or, or we pick up. Um, so short answer is, butts and seats and figure out a way to replicate for Tita Center and TDCU. Nice. And just uh, just to let you know, in case you haven't monitored all the message boards and things like that, a big thank you for the change uh, for the football program. And your your selection was by far the most popular choice of the fans leading up to that point. So well, lots I of support out there. I just went straight to the message board and said, who should we hire her? And, and they gave it to us. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. I don't know if this is really out there much. Um, I called Kelvin, you know, Sunday morning when we let Dana go. And I was like, hey, coaches, we're making a change. And he stopped me and goes, well, you'd be a, you know, he, he, used, he was very polite, but he goes, yeah. you'd be a, if you don't go to New Orleans and go talk to that guy. Unfortunately, he was yeah. already at the top of our list. <laughs> you know, it, it, as they say, every athletic director, you know, we keep lists and yep. you're always prepared for the inevitable of some type of change if and when it happens. And Coach Fritz, I, I mean, I've been following him since his days when I played here a long time ago. You know, he was at Blinn and then, you know, and different points in between. But Sam Houston, I remember the Sam Houston runs in particular. And what people don't realize, he was an old spread option guy. Yeah. And his evolution, and one of the things that I appreciate most about him is he fits whatever he does to the talent that he has. And, um, you know, that's why they turned into a more multiple pro team at Tulane. And guys, I've had the, you know, one of the great privileges in my job is I get to go to practice, whether it's Coach Sampson or Coach Fritz or Coach Whitting or anybody else. Um, but being out of football practice, there's, there's a different vibe. There's a lot of teaching going on. There's a lot of energy, a lot of communication, a lot of attention to detail. And um, those things that kind of tripped us up in the past that, you know, we all got frustrated with, I, you know, we're not going to beat ourselves. And I know coaches said that, but you can see that. And here's what's crazy. We start spring, spring practice next week. I mean, it's on us. Yeah, exciting. And so uh, it's an exciting time. And I, I, I don't want to say the winds that are back, but certainly it feels like we're, we're getting a little nudge from the behind because everybody's the excitement between basketball and all our spring sports. But with Coach Fritz being here in football, it's, it's very refreshing. It, it makes my job a lot easier when I go out and talk to donors. Yeah, <laughs> nice. Coach Fritz being hired is I have not come across anyone who hasn't just completely lauded that move, that, yeah. that decision. So uh, I've got to imagine that, that that will translate into more support. Okay. From an overall campus experience perspective, our school has changed dramatically from the days that we were in school. <laughs> and it was primarily a commuter school. 
you know, now with all the, the housing on and near campus, school's profile has certainly changed for the better. Uh, as we're now part of the Big 12, what can athletics do to help foster a generation of engaged students that transition into engaged alumni that will remain connected to the university over the next over the next several decades uh, or more? You know, it's kind of similar to an extent to what goes on at A and M or or UT. Uh, uh, first win, you know, that yeah, right, goes yeah. a long way. You know, when well, we're winning, A and M hasn't yeah. had to win, so. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you said that I didn't. Uh, I don't want to get hot mic'd on that one. But, uh, you know, it's uh, I was at a, a Jim Nance came on campus and he was speaking to a group um, this last spring and somebody asked a very similar question. He goes, same answer. He was like, when? But, you know, for us, you know, having the ability to reach across campus and the relationship with our students is paramount. Um, that's our next generation, period. Whether it's donors, leaders, uh, business leaders, whatever that is in the community, that our students are that next generation. And you think about where we started before we had TDCU or the Fertitta Center. I mean, for the longest time, you know, we were playing our games at the Astrodome. And so there wasn't any affinity that was linked back to the university. Now we're at the point where, you know, we're drawing 5,000 students a game in football and we're over a thousand students a game in basketball. And that's how we start creating that culture of, hey, I want to go to those events. I want to be there. That person then turns into, into a single game buyer when maybe they don't have the money to buy season tickets. Then they buy season tickets and they turn into donors. Um, but we have to continue to be very mindful and very proactive with reaching across campus and engaging the students any and every way possible that we can. We have to meet them where they want to be met because that market changes with young people so quickly. You know, I'm in, in a positive way, I guess. I'm fortunate. I've still got my my kids are still at home, 18 and 20, 18 to 22. So they're the same age as, as kids at college. And the way we communicate with them, the way we outreach to them. I mean, it used to be you went and banged on doors and handed out flyers. And now it's predominantly through social media or, or technology. We have to find ways to make it easier for our kids to get tickets. Um, we have a ticketing system that everybody agreed upon, but we still have moments where it, it, our kids get confused and we're, we're reaching a certain population, but we want to broaden that. I think we have to continue to do that. The other part is, is I think we need to figure out, because we do have a pretty broad demographic of students, those that are following intercollegiate athletics or not, we have to find a way to maybe in, initiate them into what college athletics is. Because when you show up and you feel that energy in the building, that's what gets you so excited. It's that communal experience and the energy of that shared moment of excitement that happens in, in play. We have to figure out a way to initiate or in, in introduce that to some of our students that have that haven't had the experience, the opportunity to experience that. And that's, that's a nonstop evolving task. Um, you know, uh, it's just one of those things that will never be, it'll never be good enough and we'll never be satisfied. Makes perfect sense. The next question, you've actually addressed this. I don't know if you want to add any more to it, but it, it was any updates on players taking advantage of the COVID year. And you said that everyone, but, but my leak is available, uh, obviously shed Robert's crier, uh, what it'll take to get them back. And again, you've addressed it, but if you want to reiterate that point and hammer it home, I'm sure everyone is interested in, in listening. Sure. Yeah. It, it, you know, again, the entire basketball team, other than Malik has the opportunity to come back. They all have additional eligibility. And so, you know, some of these kids may have the option of being drafted or two way contracts. And so, as we think about what NIL, op the opportunity that name, image, and likeness presents now, you know, particularly in basketball and baseball, where those sports where you have minor league systems, you have the opportunity now of holding on to those kids and retaining them because they have the opportunity to earn the same amount or more in college versus going into the pros. And so for us, particularly with basketball, we need to find about a million dollars of new money, uh, whether it's corporate or or individuals, please call me. We'll, we'll find a way to make it work. Um, 
And, and in football, we need a mil- about $2 million of new money um, for an IL for the football team. If we do that, we we'll, we will have a top 25 recruiting class in football. Um, I know that um, Coach has got um, a, a really significant list of kids that are coming in for the Kansas game here um, in a week and a half for football recruiting. But with the caliber and the, and the level of kids that he's talking about, we're talking four and five star kids almost exclusively that are coming in on this visit. You know, those conversations, you know, and name image likeness comes up and we have to be able to have answers for that. And so that's why, you know, you're going to see us pushing very, very hard in that space. I think it's something that, you know, for if you're my age, it, it just feels so foreign to you of you know, compensating kids. But the reality is, our business, our, our, our endeavor has changed, you know, with name, image, and likeness and the other things that are coming, um, in our space. And when I say coming, I'm talking in the next 30 days to three months, you're going to see some very significant changes in the intercollegiate space. I, we will be compensating kids in some level, um, through the athletic department. Compensation will be an opportunity for our kids. We have to stop thinking about this as, and I, I don't know, I don't want to, I got to say this the right way. Um, the educational component of intercollegiate athletics is becoming less important. Um, I hate it saying that it, it feels very um, wrong to me, but that's just reality. This is becoming a business and we have to start thinking about it as a business. And so as we solve what athletics is going to be, we have to think about setting aside the, you know, the, 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 the infrastructure, the bureaucracy of what intercollegiate has been with some of the NCAA rules and think about it, about how you run a business and how, how you deal with student athletes. If you call them student athletes, if they're employees or not, I mean, we, we're getting ready to get into, oh, we're already in it, a very seismic change of what intercollegiate athletics is and will look like. Hey, Chris, I got a question for you. It's probably way out there, but do you think we'll ever see a point where a player will play like they do in the NBA or NFL where they play for a school like 10 to 12 years? Uh, you know, they, that, <laughs> you know, you know that's a, a fair question. That's a really good – there's a there's a lawsuit that just went down with a basketball player where he's like on year seven or eight because of COVID uh-huh. and, and multiple injuries, and he had timed out. Um I don't know the answer to that, but we have to start thinking about this differently because think about, okay, if we're going to compensate student athletes, then, but there's not, this is where it gets really complicated. I could, this, we could be here for days, but there isn't the ability to have collective bargaining with the student athletes because they're not employees. And without some level of bargaining, you know, we're doing it almost in a vacuum and they're all being bargained through litigation. And when you settle or you, you get some outcome through litigation, that's binding, right? And so we don't have the ability to talk about, you know, length of eligibility. Another one that should probably start coming up is number of contests. You know, we we're, we're capped at 12 football games outside of a championship game, but the revenue that's derived through each home contest is significant. And if we're going to start compensating athletes and right now, the way the system is for us, if, if, if we're able to start compensating athletes, we don't have any budget for that. So it's unfunded. So we have to find new ways of creating money to be able to solve that. That means we're going to have to find more home events, you know, more football games, more basketball games, things that we can help use to drive revenue, um, as well as all the other opportunities we already tra- chase in our traditional lines of business, whether it's sponsorship or our philanthropic efforts. Um, so the, the question is great. I think all that's on the table. Um, those are things that we're going to have to get answered. Hey, Chris, in terms of raising the the million dollars to bring back some or, or hopefully all the players, th- there are a couple of alumni that asked me to let you know that you can reach out to them anytime and they'd be willing to pick up the, the majority of that tab. Uh, one would be Rob James. The other would be Adrian Pippery. So <laughs> just, to, just to, to, to help you out as much as I can. That's great. Um, Robbie's <laughs> due for a big donation and uh, Pippery's cheap. So we just uh, got to work on them. Actually, it's the other way around. Um, Rob's cheap and, and Pip's due for a big donation. 
Uh, but no, I'll, I'll definitely hit them up. <laughs> I'll work them hard. I'll tell them you said that, Bill. Please do. Okay, I think we're at our final question. And this comes from uh, an, another big uh, U of H fan and a, and a big fan of yours, young Ronnie Bradshaw, who said that, I imagine it's too early to know this, you know, with any level of certainty. And I'm paraphrasing a little bit. Assuming that we finish out the regular season undefeated, we're the one seed, presumably in the South. Are we headed to Memphis for the first two rounds, or you know, is, is Omaha a possibility? Any any insight? Um, you know, it's it's interesting. I get asked that quite a bit, particularly this time of year. Frankly, there isn't any insight. The only thing that helps us is with us uh, being with the level of success that we're having on the court. The opportunity to be a one seed helps drive where we go, obviously. And what they do at that point is it becomes regionalized. Um, Jamie Pollard is our representative for the Big 12 on the Basketball Selection Committee. Um, and he's he's been an incredible resource for us as I talk to him about certain aspects of what we're trying to do as a program, but also understand uh, some of the things that go into you know, slotting where people go. Dan Gavitt is somebody because of the success we've had that I've had the opportunity to talk to about these things. The short answer is no, I don't get any uh, insight. It it just doesn't work like that. What they do is they'll go into a room, they'll rank. It's a series set of of rankings. So they obviously start at the top, then they'll go one, one through four. And depending upon who's in that top group, I mean, whether it's somebody else that has some regional tie and if they're a higher one seed, then they get the benefit of the region that's closest to them as they try to protect those seeds. Um, So uh, I don't have a lot of insight, but I I would say if things stand the way they are, I I think that that's a fair assumption. Um, But I, I, you know, I, I try not to even get into that because it's just, it's so up in the air because so many things could change. Somebody could go, somebody, somebody could lose a player and they could get hurt and go in the tank the last two weeks, which completely flipped this thing. Yep. Knock on wood. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's it for the questions that came in from the board. So do you guys have anything else, Steve, Tom? Yeah. If you wouldn't mind, if I could pose a question here and you'd kind of highlighted that as college athletics has become more of a business obviously with the business, then performance comes to the forefront, especially for revenue sports like football, men's, women's basketball, baseball, women's volleyball, things of that nature. What's your expectation moving forward as part of the Big 12, right? As you assess performance for the other revenue sports, obviously men's basketball has been elite and you've made the change on football. You know, women's volleyball has been fantastic as well. But how about some of these other sports? What What's your expectation and, and kind of horizon for performance? As a general rule right now, as we're transitioning Big 12, you know, every sport's different. Um, where we progress certainly with basketball is not where we are with something else. For me, and what we've talked to our coaches about is get to the postseason. Competing for a Big 12 championship right now is probably ambitious in most of our sports, but figure out a way to get to the postseason. To do that, particularly, and I'll use baseball as an example, you got to win your non-conference games. And then you got to hold your own league. Everything that we've done with our analysis, we've got outside entities that help assist us with scheduling and understanding what it takes to make the tournament. That's the model that fits. Schedule smartly in non-conference games, win those non-conference games, and then hold your own in league play. And if you do that, because of the halo effect of being in a P4 conference that helps elevate you to get into the postseason. Once we get into the postseason, then we can build off of that because obviously all the things that come with that additional resources, recruiting, those things that help build into becoming championship caliber programs. By and large, we're in pretty good shape with facilities. And and, and I say pretty good. I should say we're in good shape with facilities. Fertitta Center is excellent. Our training facility is excellent. Football, the stadium is excellent. The IPF is excellent. The new building that's going to come on board will be excellent. Where we have to continue, and baseball is in, in, in great shape. We have to help out everybody else. Fortunately, volleyball gets the benefit of playing in the Petita Center. I, I would actually say probably volleyball above our sports 
has the best setup because they've got pre practice court, three practice courts over in, in the Athletics Alumni Center and their locker rooms over in Fertitta Center and then they play in Fertitta Center. I mean, they've, they've got a great setup, but it also helps having an incredible coach with Coach Rear. I mean, he's the yeah, real deal. Absolutely. Um, but short answer to your question is get to the postseason and then let's build off of that. Um, we've got some room to improve in some areas and we'll address those. One thing I just, you know, it, that it feels important to say is, you know, we've been operating when I first got here, um, uh, I just finished my sixth year starting my seventh year. Our operating budget was about $48 million when I got here. As we sit here today, we're about $95 million. Um, yeah, the average probably. of the big 12 is right about is between 115 and 125. So that's, we've got a growth schedule to grow into that over the next five years. Um, the vast majority of that has to come from self-generated revenue um, to give us a chance. So we've put a, a huge emphasis on our revenue sports. And, and, and to correct you, Steve, football and basketball make the vast majority of all the revenue. Sure. Um, outside of probably the SEC and baseball, you know, that's, that's just the way it is. Football and basketball drive everything financially. So for us, you know, we're mindful of where our coaches are compensated where their operating budgets are, because sometimes making a change, particularly in this first year of the Big 12, the resources aren't there for us to invest the right way to support a new coach coming in um, or where we need to be in some of those sports. And so we've been very clear with our coaches about what we have and how we're growing it. Um, but our, our primary focus has been focus on football and basketball financially and growing those opportunities re from a revenue standpoint. Um, our front facing units, um, development and ticketing and um, MMR, all those areas that touch revenue, make sure we're capitalizing on this opportunity and then student athlete health and welfare. Those are our three priorities over the first two years until we get to the full share. And once we get to that full share in year three, it gives us a lot more uh, maneuverability and flexibility to address um, areas of need that we know exist. Awesome. Thanks. All right. Anything else? Well, I think that that pretty well covers the questions. I don't know, Chris, did you have any maybe closing comments, any type of State of the Union address to conclude everything? I, I didn't prepare a state of the union, uh, but I'll work on, I'll see if I can uh, shoot from the hip, but you know, it, we are in, in, a, in an incredible period right now um, for athletics and the university. It, it, this is very, very special. Um, you know, what Kelvin and the basketball team continue to do and the pride that people have is um, something I wish I could bottle and sell. It's, it's yeah, special. Absolutely. And to see how that energy transcends and affects the rest of the department. Um, and then also with Willie coming in and um, how refreshed everybody is and how a cloud has been lifted off of all of us. It feels like, um, you know, we're, 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 we're setting ourselves up for, you know, extending this run. And, um, you know, I'm really excited about where um, the vast majority of our spring sports are. We still have a room to improve in some spots, but, you know, tracks, the top 10, the, the indoor track uh, rankings just came out today. Indoor track um, for the men is the top 10 program in the country. And we, I think we finished fourth or fifth at indoors at, at Big 12 championships this last weekend. So that kind of puts some things into context as we feel maybe frustrations with competitive success. You know, you can have a top 10 team that finishes fifth in the league and, and it's just, you know, but I know what my job is and what the expectations are is to give our coaches and our kids the resources to win and compete at the highest level of the Big 12. And we're a lot closer to being really good than we are the other. And I couldn't be more thankful for our fans and the opportunity to be with you guys today to help tell this story. Um, happy to come on any other time as you guys have questions. I, I awesome. think this level of dialogue is important because so often I get hit with questions, maybe on a concourse and you know, it's, I want to be able to give them the context for the answer as opposed to just a yes or no, because without understanding the, what's going on around it, um, it, it can be misconstrued. And so um, anytime guys, but 
I'm, I'm, I'm so thankful and pleased to be in this role at this moment and, and the opportunity to experience what we're experiencing. It's, it's incredible. No, that's awesome. Thanks so much, Chris. Really appreciate yep. the yeah, time that you, you've Chris. spent with us, especially during off hours. So thank you so my, much. My pleasure, fellas. Have a good night. And uh, I'll hit Robbie and Pippa for a donation bill and uh, I'll make sure you get 10% of the commission. All right. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> oh, well, if that's the case, please don't forget Ted Party as well. Oh, he's definitely on the list and he's he's definitely due. <laughs> All right, guys, go Cougs. Perfect. Hey, thanks. Yep. Go Cougs. Appreciate you. Go Cougs. <laughs>